I can tell by the laughter in the room that either you were a parent of a child where you would have asked that question, uh, or you were actually one of those kids at one point in your life where you had fear your parent would have hesitated for a minute. But I, I tell the story to make a very important point. You're unlikely to ever meet an individual who says that he or she does not care about our children. All of us truly want what is best at some level for our kids. But the way that people express it seems to vary a great deal. The man in my story was being asked a very clear question, exactly what steps are you willing to take to help a child? What kind of priority do children have for you when the going gets tough, when there are choices to be made? And his answer revealed what may be an even harder question. Which children are you willing to help? So the truth of the matter is that the vast, vast majority of parents would do whatever it would take to get across that I-beam. In fact, I think virtually any adult would do what it would take to save that child. But as a society, perhaps through our benign neglect, we don't. And kids are slipping through the cracks, and to one extent or another, are falling into that gorge. Maybe not to their death, but to some negative outcome that would otherwise be preventable. And too many of those children, with the, are the, with the children with the least amount of power in our communities, living in impoverished families, in disadvantaged communities, and far too many of those children are children of color. So what do we do with this knowledge? What are the implications for our policies and practices? I maintain that on a policy level and practice level, in order to do this work well, to be successful, our focus must be on children, youth, and families within the context of their communities. First, we have to understand that the families and communities from which these children come and who are in our care are not enemy territory. And when we wrap services, support, and supervision around each child and family in an individualized way, these efforts have to be based in the community and backed by strong community connections. It's in this way that we make positive, long-term connections for kids and create a sense of stability in their lives. We must therefore develop strong state and I think national policies on what we want every child and youth to have as the developmental underpinnings of their growth into adulthood. Policies that encompass child welfare and related systems and that are family focused. Which brings me to perhaps one of the most important aspects of our work, family engagement. And some thoughts I'd like to share as we open this conference. First, the families in our child welfare system have both strengths and weaknesses. And in our work with them, we need to identify and build on those strengths and overcome those weaknesses. Second, we need to disabuse ourselves of the notion that we can or should separate these youth from their families, whether it be as a youth reuniting with their family or aging out of foster care. We need to work with our young people as they re-engage with their families, helping them to navigate those families in a healthy way. This push and pull around the role of families has been a focal point of our juvenile court since its inception 110 years ago. We have been conflicted about how to best apply the doctrine of parents patriae and the thought expressed to the Adoption and Safe Families Act that we could rush our young people into permanency through termination of parental rights and by establishing what some would argue is arbitrary time periods around reunification without providing, and this is key, without providing the resources to do so in a way that truly serves the child's and the family's best interests. We have struggled in this regard with how to view and place the family in our work with their children. And what we know now is that we do our best work if they are at its core, not at its periphery. This will require us in many instances to reinvent who we are as organizations, adopting a family-centered and strength-based practice model, one that is supported by a well-trained workforce that truly embraces the strengths of the family they serve and treats them with respect. It demands the adoption of practices such as family group team decision making, where performance is measured by customer satisfaction and case outcomes. And it incorporates quality assurance methods that include not only how workers treat and work with families, but other court personnel as well, including the judiciary. I was in Ohio a few weeks ago and I was talking to the administrative judge in a county and he said he actually goes into the courts after hours and listens to the tapes 
of the judges, the magistrates, and how they talk to the families. So he can give them feedback on what he is considering a priority, although he cannot control their behavior. He cannot say, you're no longer a judge on my bench. He doesn't have that authority, but he can guide and shape and hold them at some level accountable for treating the families who come before him or her with respect and dignity. And those are the things we need to be doing more and more of. And that 